Hi, everyone. It's Jamie here this week, and I am so excited to uh, talk to our guest speaker for this week. Um, her name is Christine Michelle Carter. If you do not know her, um, you need to, you need, you're going to know her today, and you're going to start following her today. Um, I've been following her for a while on social media. I have read her book. She's a speaker. She's an author. Um, she is she's, she's written two books, as I mentioned, one is called mom AF, um, which is a fucking phenomenal book for empowering women and mothers. Um, she's written a children's book as children's book as well, which the title makes me laugh out loud. Can, can mommy please go to work now? <laughs> um, and her role is, um, and, and what you do for a living, uh, Christine is, is empowering, really empowering working women um, to feel more confident in their cu current roles, to advance into leadership roles, to get paid more fairly, and really ultimately to feel more satisfied in their careers. Um, yeah. Right. So, so, so excited to have you here with us today. Um, so excited to, to have this conversation. Welcome to our podcast. Thank you. Anything so much. else that I missed in the introduction here that you want to no, add? No, no, no. Thank you so much, Jamie. I'm happy to be here. Probably the only thing is that I'm a mother to two. Yeah. Yep. yep. An 11 year old girl and a seven year old boy. And I am so ready for school to start yeah. as we were saying. You know, that's what we were just saying before we started recording. And it's not, we we're saying it's not because like I'm sick of them. It's like, it's good for everybody. It's good for their, you know, for them, for their routine, for us. Um, yeah. yeah. So that's I just you there. I'm sick of them. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> let's be honest. I am sick of them. That's just not the only reason, right? <laughs> Um, so I would love to just get a little bit of a background from you, Christine, on, on your career. Um, and, you know, if you want to give us like the, the brief overview, I don't want you to feel like you're, you know, reading off a resume here. Um, but really what I'm curious about what is what was the catalyst um, for you to get into this work? Um, was it a moment? Did it happen after becoming a mom? have you always felt like this was your calling and what was the journey to get here? I would love to, to hear from yeah. you what that, what that journey was like. Absolutely. It totally happened because I became a mother. Yeah. I've always been in marketing, specifically content marketing. So writing has always been my passion. Yep. And once I became a mother and I worked for a predominantly white male tech startup, I had to pump in a bathroom stall when I returned and I returned earlier than I should have because I had a baby in the NICU at 31 weeks in a day. Wow. So I'm dealing with a baby in the NICU. I didn't even have time to get the uh, CPR classes or do Lamaze right. or anything like that. I was thrust into motherhood. And I come back and I am just at a loss of what to do. I remember throwing away breast milk. I remember um, pumping in the bathroom stall and I'm realizing I had rights as a, a federal employee or as an employee in the United States. Yep. Um, I was just a mess. I was, a tr I had anxiety. I had a little bit of postpartum depression, all things that nobody was really educating me about. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, I don't ever want another woman to go through this. And mm -hmm. I've always been an advocate for underrepresented groups. Mm -hmm. So I thought that if I am a strong writer, I'm going to use that skill to the best of my knowledge and make sure that I am educating women as much as I can. And be it in a funny way, be it in an impactful yeah. way, be it in an educational way, I'm going to make sure that everybody knows how hard it is to be a working mom. And I think you've really beautifully done that um, in, in articles that you've written in your book of really making the connection between um, the, the serious nature of the lack of support for women, for mothers, for women and mothers in marginalized communities, right? Um, and, and doing it in a way where it is factual and statistically significant, um, but also bringing in a, a bit of that humor piece, um, which is yes. so important to this human experience, right? Like there are things that you, you have to be able to laugh about, you have to be able to have a sense of humor about, and I think that you really do that in a beautiful way with your writing um, to make to make readers feel seen, um, but also, you know, it's not just for the humor. It really is, there, there are actionable things and steps that you give um, that are based on research and, and, and actually helpful. And, and, and otherwise, I mean, I think we can both agree, like, and an otherwise, what feels like a pretty chaotic time. 
Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You get me, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> so rare you know mothers like we it's a very isolating and lonely occupation and I consider it an occupation for sure yeah. so to have somebody understand you is it's such a good feeling well right and I feel like too it's that it, it really is that balance right because I had a woman say to me recently and I think this pretty much sums up motherhood um is it's like it's either too formal and or medical and not customized, right? So like you go to your nine month pediatrician appointment and it feels like your pediatrician reads off of a script, right? Like, mm -hmm. so it's too medical and not personalized or it's too informal and chaotic, yeah. right? And, and I think that it's rare to find somebody like you who finds that balance, I really do. So thank you, thank you. I mean, truly thank, thank you for you that. Um, so, you know, in this being your calling, um, following, following motherhood, what, how has your vision evolved and how has it stayed the same in terms of what your goal is in, in supporting and empowering women and mothers? So the vision originally started as helping women navigate work as new mothers. Mm -hmm. And as I started to think, as you said, like holistically about the motherhood experience or the female experience after you yeah. became a mother, I realized there was so much for me to write about. Yeah. And I stretched Forbes and I challenged them on some art articles that seemed like they were out of scope, but absolutely contributed to the working motherhood experience. I've written about being a 420 mom. I've written about anxiety. I've mm -hmm. written about advocacy and um, running for, you know, local or state office as a working mom. So I've written across the gamut. Yep. I've written about sex as a single mom. I've written about divorce. I've written about what it means to be a mom who's a black mom or yep. an Asian mom or yeah. a Hispanic mom. So I've covered a lot of things with regards to the motherhood experience and it continues to evolve. The pandemic certainly made it evolve even further. Once mm -hmm. I started to look at research, found that generation Z, well, they're becoming mothers. They're not like the millennial mothers that I started writing yeah. about many years ago, but also right. they have women in their cohort who are choosing not to become mothers. And that is absolutely detrimental to our economy. Mm -hmm. And it just goes to show that they're not having children because of how millennials and their peers are being treated as mothers. Mm -hmm. So if we can't get the problem solved with the mothers of today, our economy is going to continue to suffer. So the the writing that I the 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 mission definitely changes as as time goes generation. on, and I learn more yeah. and more about the motherhood experience. I mean, beautifully said. On um, like a change has to happen now, otherwise it's detrimental across the board. Here, um, you I feel like this is a good segue into talking about the gender gap because we have made strides in the gender gap. Yeah. Um, and women are getting paid more for the same roles that men are doing. It's not, it's not equal yet, but we're making strides. The interesting part of these strides is that if you remove mothers from that and you look at the gender gap of mothers, it actually, we haven't made That's any right. strides at all. Yep. What would, what's your explanation for why that's happening? So mothers are penalized professionally. They are subject to unconscious bias and a lot of stereotypes. They're seen as less productive, which studies show that they are not. They're more productive. They can get more done in the day because they're focused. They're managers at home and at work. Um, they are judged by women and men, those with children and without children. The anecdotes that I've heard from women over the years about how they're perceived in the workplace just because they gave birth is absolutely ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But yes, we have made strides in the wage gap. And then the pandemic came and was like, psych yeah. bitch, I'm pulling you out the workplace <laughs> because you're a mom. I'm yep. taking out childcare. Yep. It was already bad and yep. I'm making it worse. And now we're in the middle of a childcare crisis. Yep. And that's pushing, that continues to push a lot of working mothers out of the workforce. And for those who are there, it is stifling their career yep. because they're like, can I really try and go up for a promotion when I, know, I don't know what my schedule is going to be? I don't know if I'm going to have childcare. I don't know if I can really devote the kind of time that everybody thinks I should give. Right. 
but I know that I can still give a great performance or I can still be productive, but it's about what the shoulds are in the office. So yep. yeah, it's very, it's very difficult. I don't know that there will ever be a solution for that. Right. We just need more women who are working mothers right. and mom executives to feel comfortable and confident in bringing their authentic selves to work. Right. And I think as time progresses, hopefully people will realize that mothers do contribute and can contribute to higher paid positions. Um, I mean, I think that's the way that we change this world too, right? It's having more women in leadership positions, more, I mean, yeah. more moms in leadership positions too. Um, it's funny that you, you brought up the solutions piece, right? Because I think a lot of companies, um, and correct me if you feel like it's different. I feel like a lot of companies are focusing on how to, um, maybe help with the childcare expenses. Right. And, um, now there's, there's ways that we can help with childcare costs. There are other countries who are doing it differently and a lot better than we are. Um, so we have models to work off of here. Um, but, but I, I believe that that's obviously not the only way to solve this problem, right? Like that's not the only way to keep women in the workforce or satisfied in the workforce by helping out with childcare costs or even completely covering childcare costs because of the stereotypes that you are seeing across women and mothers in the workplace. 100%, and it definitely yeah. varies depending on where you are in the country. So when you right. think about West Coast companies, yeah, they are trying to solve right. with childcare solutions. Everywhere else though, that would be a dream. They're not trying to solve with childcare no, solutions. Right. They're saying, here's a mental health EAP program, yeah. figure it out. Yep. Or here's a mentorship program, figure it out. And it's putting a Band-Aid on a broken leg. Right. Yes, childcare is an issue, but it's a three-pronged approach. It's the employer supporting flexible and remote schedules, understanding that we're, mothers can contribute to the conversation or mothers, I'm sorry, can improve the workplace and be productive. Yep. It is solving the childcare crisis right. and looking at legislation. But it's also on the mother too. And I have to be honest, it's on the mother as well to bring yep. her authentic self to work. Yep. I do. This is a this great segue into my next question, which is you work with both individuals um, or groups of individuals, women, um, and work with companies and decision makers within companies and executive staff. I would love to hear the difference between how you how you work with those two different groups. So when thinking about this three-pronged approach, as you mentioned, um, taking childcare out of it, when you are working with um, a, a woman, a mother, or a group of women, what does what does that conversation look like? What are what are the things um, that you feel are most important in terms of providing more education support um, to them for, in particular, when it comes to obviously being being a working woman or a working mother? Yeah, at the core, I really believe that, again, that motherhood is a very lonely thing. So I am always trying to encourage them when I'm working with a group that they are not alone mm -hmm. to please speak up. Please feel like this is a safe space. Please mm -hmm. share your experiences. They don't have to be specific workplace experiences. You can talk about how frustrating it was to get dressed this morning while your child was trying to figure out how to unlock their iPad. Even that experience can sometimes make another woman feel understood and make her feel less anxiety in the workplace. So I'm always encouraging my, oh, okay. No, I was going to say, there's also oh. so much support. I mean, so yes. much research to support that. There's so much research yes. to support yes. peer groups. Um, in particular, Harvard Business yeah. Review, hopefully I'm not butchering this. They actually just released an article maybe a month ago about mm -hmm. this, like not the, the having, feeling like you have that peer support group in the workplace actually increases employee right. satisfaction and mm -hmm. keeps the employee engaged or employed at that company longer. So this yeah. isn't like a, we all, you know, shared human experience and we all need to like sit around and talk about it, it actually is based on research. Yeah. Um, and then on a personal level, re it's ba based on research, the peer support helps overall mental health. Yeah, it's a very intention of an employee resource group, exactly, which is 100%. why I, I always urge companies to create a working parents ERG and not just exactly. a win, because those are two different audiences. Agreed. But um, I'm always encouraging mom buddy programs. So just randomly pairing up with somebody in the workplace yep. and being able to speak openly about your experiences, even better if they are at a different level 
of motherhood than you. Yep. And then independently, oh my goodness, it's it's so hard. I just did a coaching session with somebody and I'm telling you, I have a structure where I know that I am only to do someone's LinkedIn profile or somebody's resume. And every single time I want to do everything short of get that person, like interview for that person at a job because <laughs> yep. I will hear each mother's story and I can, I can empathize and I know what it takes. And I am going above and beyond to revamp their career for them as much yeah. as I possibly can. So um, it, it is, uh, it is uh, being an advocate. I, I do feel like this, my passion, it's my calling. It's what the Lord wants me to do. It is hard to work individually with women because I want to see right. something change for every single woman. Yeah. 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 I mean, the, we are lucky to have you in, in Absolutely. our corner, um, with that kind of passion, truly. Um, Absolutely. when we're, when you're talking about, so, so obviously, generally speaking, we want, we definitely want that, that, that shared human experience in that, in that community. That's hugely important. Um, you know, like we talked about, are there certain, you must have certain topics, um, that come up repeatedly is, is there one or two topics that you say are like the ones that come up most often? Is it, um, you know, the difficulty saying no or setting boundaries? Yeah. Um, is it feeling, you know, guilty, um, yeah. and, or shameful for, for asking for something or doing something? Um, I mean, I'm throwing out things that yeah, I, no, I feel like might guilt. be at the top of your list, but I'm no parent guilt, guilt, feeling yeah. guilty for everything associated with wanting to work which I think is so unfortunate because God bless the team over at Motherly and their state of motherhood survey. I would be nothing without it, but it shows that second to motherhood, a woman's career is what defines her. I know. So it is so unfortunate to me that somebody who has all their life decided that they want to be XYZ profession feels guilty about that just because they gave birth. There's right. no reason to feel guilty about that, but right. parent, parenting guilt is probably number two. Number one would be imposter syndrome yep. for sure. Yep. Um, burnout and mental health problems associated with yep. it would be third on the list. But those okay. are the recurring themes that I hear. Yeah. And so thinking about that, um, there are obviously support systems um, that you can put in place, coaching that you can give individual woman, women, um, but that's only one of the pieces of the puzzle. The other piece of the puzzle is what the employer or company can be doing to better support um, women and mothers. Right. And you have talked about um, what people can do on an individual level, but also what companies can do on an individual level to support something like, for example, preparing for going out on a leaf and coming back from a leaf. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, having a runway for both, which is, is not typical, um, right. for companies. Right. Yep. I mean, and it I think when I was doing it, <laughs> right. And I think it, and I think we, we started to scratch the surface of this conversation with the pandemic. Right. I think there is, you know, I feel like this is so overstated, but without having another word for it, like the silver lining of it is we are starting to scratch the surface of these, of certain things that we haven't really talked about, right. Mental health what, what the mother's impact really is in our economy and the workforce. Right. right and right. also like these systems that we just don't fucking have in place. Right. right and right. one of them is like re-entry into the workforce, re-entry into the office. Right. Um, and what that actually looks like. And like, the funny thing is like mothers have been figuring this out themselves for years yeah. without the support of the company. Yeah. But now that everybody went from working from home and needs to re-enter into the workforce, re-enter into the office, now we're talking about it. And, and I feel like this is an opportunity to actually lean into women and mothers who have been doing this for fucking years. Absolutely. That's the whole idea of my mom buddy program. Mothers right. in Chick-fil-A, they can solve every type of crisis America has. <laughs> I have no idea why we don't that. lean on them more. And it's <laughs> unfortunate to me because I've met some really brilliant mothers who um, have decided to become advocates themselves, but don't want to formally um, take on that role with their employer or take it on um, from a government perspective. And I think that they should. 
I really do. I always encourage women to step up in leadership roles. Yeah. So what would you say is in structuring these conversations, you're having one conversation with the individual. How is that different from when you do work with um, a company or an executive staff or decision makers or HR or founders, depending on the size of the company? What, What do those conversations look like? Yeah. So the latter conversation looks like me saying, listen, guys, when I'm coming in from my signature mental health talk, that's a band-aid, but let's fix the broken leg. (laughs) It will take time to heal. It's not an overnight fix. And I think that companies want in this day and age, um, aggressive growth, increased revenue now, now, now. I mean, we can look at the latest round of layoffs and how they keep happening quarterly to quarterly. Nobody waits for seasonality anymore. Nobody waits for anything. It's just a world of instant gratification yes. and the HR and an employee experience is no different. Yep. But it takes time to turn that ship into course correct mm-hmm. and to become one of those best places to work because you are offering mental health support or you're offering resources to working parents. It takes research. It takes an investment mm-hmm. in, in the resources that you're offering. It takes an investment into your team. And a lot of companies just want to do that band-aid approach of a talk. And it's more so me stepping back and saying, okay, so after this talk, what's going to happen next? What are we doing yeah. after this? Like, yeah. what is that? What is the long term plan here? Yeah. Um, is there any? And then, if is is there um, ever a, a moment or an opportunity for you to also provide some coaching to people in management or leadership positions around how to better support the working mother and parent as well? Like what, yeah, what, what sort of themes do you see there, I guess, uh, in terms of, um, you know, similar question, like maybe top one or two things that you hear from um, companies or executive staffs or managers or leaders, like what, what do you feel like is coming up for them or the barriers are to providing better support beyond having to invest in actually doing it? That's probably the number one thing, right? Right. That, I mean, that really is the number one thing yeah. when I am um, making recommendations for them as a consultant, it can be something as small as let's take this space and make it a mother's room and not make it a mother's room where it just doesn't have a toilet, but let's make it a space to recharge and maybe a space for mothers who aren't necessarily breastfeeding as well, just to yep. feel comfortable and to have a space where they feel supported. Mm-hmm. But then a lot of times I'm asked because of my work investing in female or um, family tech focused companies, mm-hmm. what companies are around that offer some type of end to end solution mm-hmm. or what type of companies are supporting caregivers and working families. And I'm always happy to make those recommendations as well. Yeah. Who's doing it right? Who, who can we learn from? Well, who, well, not necessarily who's doing it. Sometimes well. I am asked who's doing it right and who can we <laughs> learn from, but who can help us do this because we don't have the time. Oh, we, what we companies are actually offering the, the solution? Got it, got it, got it. Sorry, I thought yeah. you were saying what companies are doing it well and who can we learn from, yeah. not the point solution. Yes, the point solution. What companies yeah. can actually help with this support exactly. through the whole thing? Yeah. And it not, it's not a Band-Aid approach. It is actually integrated within the company. Exactly. That's, that's where I think a lot of the approaches are like, oh, I want to build up my resource, you know, the resource list for parents that still leaves it on the parent right. to engage in the, to know about, to first of all, know about it, which depending on the communication of a company, they may not even know, right? Exactly. Um, then it's on them to reach out. And when you're talking about something like mental health, it's really fucking hard to do that when you're in it, when you're right. depressed, when you're right. anxious, when you're burnt out. Right. Um, and then I th- still think there's still, you know, there's still the level of like confusion over like what actually is, you know, covered and or not by the company too. Like there's so many moving pieces to that versus the integration of a program or a company into the, into the, um, into an agency, into these sub subsets of, of working mothers and parents and actually being the person connecting people and running programming. So I think that's such and a good oh, point. Oh, by the way, we're only going to do this once a year. Right. <laughs> no, right. People having babies all year long coming right, back exactly. and on leaves exactly. all year long. You, we'll do one. you hold that baby till November. <laughs> then we'll talk about giving you support. <laughs> it's so true. It's, it's so, so true. true. It's just, it has to be fluid and ongoing. Right. I know, right. I know. But you're right. It is. It's this. You know, we live in a in a culture in a state of instant gratification right now, and it's hard to get out of that cycle a bit. Yeah. Um, changing gears slightly. Um. So so you and I share, and this is you know uh, company wide for us too. But we share the sentiment that the way to change the world 
is through mothers. Absolutely. Um, and the more we're helping mothers step into their power, showing um, themselves self-compassion, um, giving them the opportunity to feel more empowered and more confident, we in turn are teaching children um, those skills as well. They're, they're seeing it, we're doing it. We as, as parents, as mothers are, are teaching them by the way that we act and the way that we talk. Yeah. Um, and, and, in, and so in, in supporting mothers in a better way, um, we are raising the next generation of, yeah. we're leveling up our kids, right? That's, like, right. that's what we're yeah. trying to do. We're trying to level them up. Um, you have mentioned there, we can't allow history to repeat itself. Otherwise this change, this evolution is never going to happen. Humanity is never going to get any better. Right. Um, what do you, what do you mean by that? And how do you feel about that statement in the current world that we're living in? Oh, so much. I know. So the, the first thing, the lightest thing that I'll say is most CEOs today, we know there aren't a lot of female CEOs, but most CEOs, when they're asked about where they got their core leadership skills from, which are soft skills, by the way, yep. they learned it from their mothers, whether they were in the workplace or not. So mm -hmm. to let that sink in. The second thing is that the pandemic brought women to level um, to job levels or employment levels of the 80s. Yep. And back then, there were women not bringing their authentic selves to work and pretending to be men at work. And it totally caused um, chaos. And it was it was not the best thing for our, our world back then. Yeah. Um, to think we have to go back to how our mothers call themselves thriving uh, in the workplace and at home, it's kind of terrifying to me, yeah, quite honestly. Right. I had a single working mom and not always fun, you know, not always the, the most fabulous person to be around. Was she a great example um, of what a, a woman at work could be? Yes, but do we really want... <laughs> I just don't, I don't think that we can thrive that way. And my mother would make the same argument too, that that's totally. not great for your mental health. Totally agree. The last thing I would say is that we are, you say about history repeating itself and we can't do that. We are, we are suffering like this, yeah. this uh, America is drowning. And yeah. it is because we did push women out of the workforce when the pandemic happened and those female dominant, dominated industries like the healthcare industry, like teachers, like folks in the public sector, yep. women left. Yep. And our society is going to suffer. Yeah. It is going to suffer for years on end yeah. because we lost the empathy and the soft skills that, that women brought to those industries. Yeah. Our children are gonna suffer in schools. We aren't gonna have um, great law enforcement or um, great folks in government because we lost women there. And yeah. I mean, the nursing and the childcare shortage, like that speaks to Teachers. For itself. I mean, exactly. it's, you know, you, you see this, you saw this messaging and, and you're seeing it again now around like, if you don't, you know, if you don't like what we have to offer, then, then leave you. Right. And it's like, well, they are, you know, there's, well, they are, <laughs> exactly. I mean, there's districts here in and Boston now, that have right. 80 open positions, 80. Right. You know, yeah. it, we're incredible. in a national teaching and childcare crisis. And it is, it is, I don't know when we're going to wake up and realize it. And, and I am so passionate about it. And I'm like, struggling for my words because it is the writings on the wall. Yeah. You know, yeah. we are really about to just regress yeah. as a country. I know. And, and no it, one realizes it's because we're not giving mothers and women support. Yeah. I mean, I feel like, um, I feel like women and mothers just keep taking a hit and it, and it yeah. is a little bit of like, when, when is that going to end? Um, right. and it, and as soon as you feel like you have a sl slither of hope of it, of us coming out of our ending, it feels like we take another hit. Right. Um, and it does kind of feel like a direct attack on mothers. Um, <laughs> I mean, cause it is, I guess I shouldn't say it feels like that. It really is. Yeah. Um, how do you feel? So, so let me just take one step back. Your, the way that you talked about, um, your mother and, and, that generation of working women um, to, to where we are now, right? Like, so it, it 
prior to the pandemic, it actually felt like we were making pretty good strides in terms of like women in the workforce, yeah. um, sharing more of not equal, but sharing more of the load at home with their partners, yeah. um, companies starting to, you know, recognize women as a valuable member of the team, but that, you know, there was still work to do there. And, and, and it feels like the transformation that we had made from our mothers, which really were, I mean, the, the first working women generation, yeah. the first generation of women to go to work, really, yeah, right. to us, the, the second generation, I mean, I don't know how old you are, I did not Google that before we did this call, but I'm assuming we're close, around the same age, right? Being the second generation of working women, I actually feel like we've made huge strides in terms huge of strides. what our expectations are, our confidence, um, you know, our self-compassion and not feeling, still feeling guilty, not as guilty, right? Like I do, and not feeling like, I feel like our mothers were the generation of like, I'm going to work and like, I will fucking do it all to make this work. And like, I don't care if I have to do it all and it kills me. Right. They right. robbed Peter to pay Paul. They took the punches. They did yes. that so that we could thrive and bring our authentic self. Exactly. exactly. So then we smartened up as the next generation. And, and now, and I think about this a lot and, and, and I don't think it's because I'm just, just because I'm raising three girls. I think it's just raising kids in general, but you have a daughter too. So I'm sure some, like, I sure as shit, am not going to raise another generation of girls that, like you said, goes back to what it was like in the eighties. Like I do want to level them up, but it feels sometimes really challenging to do in the world that we're living in today. So, so how, how, how. <laughs> How do we course correct? And this is the thing. At some point, it has got to stop being all on us to course correct. I totally agree. Yeah. When I say us, I mean a nation, right. not you and I. Right. I mean, you we, and I, if we want to just like right. scream this from we the rooftop. Policy yeah, but... changes. We so, so need policy changes because uh, I, I, the ex, the, you know, back in the eighties, they didn't have such a, um, a, a global and interconnected world and right. access to data to right. see how cause and effect are related with regards to this situation. And we can now see and look at the root cause of issues and see from the data, how women are disproportionately affected, what the motherhood penalty means. Yeah. All of those things are now at our fingertips. So now that we have the data, we're just going to ignore it and treat everything right. like it was the 80s. Like right. we, as a country, need to start creating policies that create some equity for working mothers. Yeah. Because um, it's for, like, you want these babies, you want an economy to keep right. running. You, you want us to keep having kids, make it easy for us. Make it yeah. a little bit easier. Yeah, 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 it's so true. Um, I want to start to wrap up here. Um, although I feel like I could talk to you for at least another 45 minutes to an hour, but we'll, we'll, we'll stay on track here. If you could give, I'm going to, there's a two part question here. If you could give one piece of advice to a working woman without children, okay. what would it be? I would advise her to build her community and build a network at work of diverse professionals so not just necessarily women her age, men too, married men, married women, mothers, just so she gets an interesting perspective, just like we know diversity breeds innovation and innovation breeds revenue for a company. She is a personal brand, build the diversity around her so that she has thought leadership coming from all different angles. I love that. How, if at all, does that advice change when you're giving advice to a working mother? The only way it changes is it's a yes and. So do that, but have confidence in yourself. Because once you become a mother, for some reason, our self-confidence just drops. And you got to trust sense. that instinct yeah. and have confidence and have faith in yourself. Oh, I love that so much. Um, Christine, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for having me, Jamie. If people want to connect with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Sure. Um, Christine Michelle Carter.com, M I C H E L. Yep. And on Twitter and on Instagram, it's C Michelle Carter. LinkedIn and Facebook, it is Christine Michelle Carter. Awesome. I'm a Beyonce fan. So my Twitter account has kind of turned into a Beyonce. I mean, you're, yeah, you're, uh, you mentioned Beyonce at every 
at every, every moment. Website, Always. love it. Corporate Always. books. It's the. I mean, it, Always. I was reading um, when I was doing, you know, a little bit of research before coming on with you today. I was reading an interview that you had, and it was your role model. Um, and that come, yes. has come up a lot. And it's Beyonce. And it's like hands down, there's nobody else professionally, mm -hmm. personally. I I hands fucking love down. that. <laughs> Since the eighth grade, and I'm 36 years ah! old. Hands down. I yes. love that. And please check out um, Christine's two books, y'all. It's um, Mother AF and Can Mommy Go to Work Now? Um, you can get them anywhere. You can get them at Amazon. Um, but please check those out. They're phenomenal books. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I feel really, really fortunate and honored to have you here with me today, Christine. I'm so excited for everybody who gets to listen to this episode and, um, and be able to learn from um, and connect with you. So thank you so much. Me too. It was such a refreshing conversation. I'm Yay. so happy that I, I was a part of it. Oh, all right. Well, it was so good to have you and maybe this will, won't be the last time that we connect. Love it. Love right. it. Awesome. Take Bye care. everyone.